I'm the Philosophical Bachelor and today I'm going to talk about a process, philosophy of science on scientific progress. It's knowledge like an Easter egg hunt where after all the eggs have been found, the game is over, where all that can be known is now known and that's that. Or it's knowledge more like the game of chess, music or even golf, where the more you know about it and the better you are at it, new horizons open up. The game expands with new peaks to surmount, fresh and exciting challenges to overcome, more moves to figure out and more strategies to master. According to philosopher Nicholas Rescher, it is more like the latter, except more complicated. Knowledge is like chess, except that once you are at a certain level of mastery, you realize that what you previously knew is wrong and the truth may be something else. But if truth changes, then is it still truth? A common expectation of knowledge and its correlate, truth, is that it is something that once known is correct for all time. Any proposition that falls short of that standard is merely a theory which may subsequently be disputed, disproved and debunked. Russia in his essay, Cognitive Processes and Scientific Progress, which is chapter 5 of his book, Process Philosophy, a survey of basic issues published in 2000, uses a process philosophy and pragmatic treatment to examine the epistemological question of how scientific knowledge progresses. The process method is eminently suitable to analyze something that changes over time since the changing over time is in itself process. And knowledge gathering is a process, a dynamic movement that changes what our knowledge is. Contrary to the common expectation outlined above, knowledge is not static, not a gathering of eternal truths because ongoing inquiry leads to new and often dissonant findings and discoveries, after which we need to change our mind as to what the truth is. If we consider knowledge to be a dialogical process, one of questions and their corresponding answers, we will be quite used to the answers changing based on new discoveries. However, there is another important mechanism at work, where the questions themselves change. This happens because as the state of knowledge changes due to new discoveries, it gives us new presuppositions which we are able to now base off of to ask questions we did not even conceive of before. When we change our minds about a particular answer, the further questions based on this superseded answer and their answers collapse. The image I have is of a cantilevered cliff extending into the air over the sea. If it breaks off midway, the half extending into the ocean collapses. Some examples rasher sites from the history of science is the ether, phlogiston, caloric fluids, and faster than light transmissions. Concepts once accepted as mainstream and later abandoned because they involve presuppositions that are no longer accepted. Once theories on these substances are considered wrong by the scientific community, questions presupposing their truth naturally evaporate, since what would be the sense in inquiring about the nature of the ether if it does not exist? Epistemic change over time thus relates not only to what is known, but also to what can be asked, writes Rescher. With new questions come new answers. This new knowledge leads to yet more new questions, enabling later generations to pose questions that could not even be thought of by previous ones. For instance, if microorganisms have not yet been discovered because the microscope has not yet been invented, surely the scientists living then could not even begin to think of the structure and mechanism of growth of such organisms. This dialectical nature of questions and answers that then enable further questions indicate that knowledge is a work in progress, something changing and not engraved in stone forever once established. Progress in our collective state of knowledge, what Rescher calls cognitive progress, is usually thought of as the discovery of new facts, new information about things. This however is only half the story since there is also progress on the side of questions when new questions become possible as our knowledge progresses. Cognitive progress can hence be in the form of 1. New and different answers to all questions, 2. New questions, or 3. A realization that our old questions are illegitimate, that we have been asking the wrong questions since they rest on incorrect presuppositions. Russia gives some examples of 3. 
Prior to Isaac Newton, the prevailing understanding of motion was Aristotle's, which states that all else being equal, an object that is moving will come to a stop on its own accord. If it continues moving, a force must be there to propel it. While we know better today, you have to transport yourself back some 2,300 years to a more naive state, where observation tells you that a rolling ball or rock comes to a stop eventually. Hence a question that can be posed under Aristotle's theoretical paradigm is, what force is it that keeps our objects moving? Enter Newton's theory of motion in the 17th century, whose first law states that all objects will continue in a straight line unless acted upon by external forces. Such a change in our understanding of motion would hence render the earlier question illegitimate. Russia comments, Scientific questions should thus be regarded as occurring in a historical setting. They arise at some juncture and not at others. They can be born and then die away. This raises the notion that what answers we have today may become invalidated by newer answers subsequently. In the philosophy of science, this is known as pessimistic meta-induction, where previous theories become debunked by later theories. Since we see this happening in the history of science, by induction, which is looking at previous experiences as a basis for prediction, we have to be open to the possibility that even our best theories today may be overtaken later. On the second mode of cognitive progress in the form of new questions, Immanuel Kant has noted that answers to questions pave the way to further as yet unanswered questions. The natural course of inquiry provides an impetus by which a given state is ultimately led to give way to its successors writes Rescher. New discoveries open up new domains of inquiry, where we dig deeper by asking questions to understand more about the discovery and how it relates to what is currently known. Such a progress gives rise to successive stages of knowledge. But can these stages be seen as progress? One depiction of progress can be when later stages answer additional questions over and above those answered at earlier stages. This is an expansionist theory where the later superior science answers all of the formerly answered questions, albeit perhaps differently, and furthermore, answers some previously unanswered questions, a sort of knowledge accumulation. However, Rescher thinks that such a view is incoherent. Say an earlier theory, T1, posits P, and a later theory, T2, posits not P. T1 can answer the question, why is P the case? but T2 cannot, since P is not the case. Hence, later theory may be in principle incommensurable with earlier ones. Russia gives some real examples where what was accepted by scientists earlier no longer holds and hence is no longer asked about, such as galenic humors in medicine and the ether in physics. When science abandons certain theoretical entities, he also forgoes gladly the opportunity to ask questions about them, he adds. Hence, in the actual course of scientific progress, we see not only gains in question resolution but also losses, notes Rescher. Some later theories that have been accepted are unable to explain some phenomena that earlier now debunked theories were able to. I will pick just one example from Rescher's list. Descartes' vortex theory could answer the question of why all the planets revolve around the Sun in the same way a question for which Newton's celestial mechanics have no answer. Hence, a theory of progress predicated on more questions being answered is untenable. Another theory of progress is to view scientific progress as an expansion in our question horizon, with more advanced science making it possible to pose issues that could not be envisaged earlier on. However, progress, in addition to rejecting all answers, also involves rejecting all questions, considering them irrelevant in a new paradigm. Russia cites Paul Feyerabend, who says that new theories generally do not subsume the substantive issues of older ones, but instead move off in altogether different directions. A third theory posits that there is scientific progress when there is a greater number of resolved questions with a new scientific theory, even if the questions are different from earlier. While sounding plausible, it is difficult to count the number of questions since further questions can always be raised about an answer's inner details and outer relationships. Besides, the quality of the questions should also matter. In much earlier times, there were answers for everything. 
the season, the weather, or the tides all find answers through the supernatural or through the movements of the stars. Today we have in hindsight much better theories, though they may not be as comprehensive as the supernatural or astrology. To be dissatisfied with answers and to seek better ones is important. Russia observes, Some of the biggest advances in science come about when we reopen questions, when our answers get unstuck en masse with the discovery that we have been on the wrong track, that we do not actually understand something we thought we understand perfectly well and need new answers to old questions. Russia posits several more theories of progress, each with its own sets of difficulties but does so in order to point out that progress is not a numbers game. Quality matters. So how does science progress, according to Rasher? As we push forward the boundaries of science, the low-hanging fruits of what we can observe through our bodily senses have been mostly reaped. To go further, we need technological escalation to more thoroughly explore the parametric space. By being able to move beyond, for instance, the visible spectrum into the invisible ultraviolet and infrared regions of light, allows more discoveries to be made. To be able to achieve higher or lower temperatures, pressures, particular velocity, field strength, and so on, we need to engineer increasingly sophisticated technology, which comes at higher cost also. Without an ever-developing process of technological advance, scientific progress would grind to a halt. The discoveries of today cannot be advanced with yesterday's instrumentation and techniques. Throughout the natural sciences, technological progress is a crucial requisite for cognitive progress, according to Rasher, where we widen the range of what we can observe and experiment on. More powerful microscopes, telescopes, particle accelerators, spacecraft and computers are just a few of the engineering innovations needed to push the frontiers of scientific discovery. Rasher observes, as science endeavours to extend its mastery over nature, it becomes enmeshed in the technology-intensive arms race against nature, with all of the practical and economic implications characteristic of such process. Rasher next examines how we theorize. Theorizing in natural science is a matter of making leaps of inductive generalization from the data. We search for the simplest, most economical pattern of regularity that can accommodate the data and then extrapolate this pattern across the possible range of a variable. The economic principles are uniformity, simplicity, and harmony, so as to find the least complex theory structure capable of accommodating the available body of data. If complications are needed, they need to pay their way in terms of increased systemic adequacy. Because we want our theories to be comprehensive, there is an ever-widening exploration of nature's parameter space, Though this is likely to be incomplete since we do not test the entire range of temperatures, pressures, particular velocities, or other parameters of interest. Even as current theories support and reliably predict phenomena, it does not mean that there is no need for subsequent revision. The technologically mediated entry into new regions of parameter space constantly destabilizes the attained equilibrium between data and theory, and it is seldom, if ever, the case that our theories survive intact in the wake of substantial extensions in our access to sectors of parametric space, writes Rasher. The regularity found in current ranges may not apply to wider ones. He observes that the history of science is a history of episodes of leaping to the wrong conclusions. As we gain the ability to look deeper into things, the phenomena, at the various levels of detail, may seem to operate differently though we can understand why we had explained the causal phenomena the way we did. The instruments and concepts we deploy to understand the phenomena impacts what we observe of it, leading us to different understandings of nature and its laws. The layers we encounter principally reflect our own procedures, while nature is as it always has been. Science is not a limited endeavour, where we will eventually discover all its laws and hence have nothing more to discover, since we can in principle discover more by probing deeper, expanding the horizons of discovery according to Russia. This however means that our knowledge will never be complete but can only be a process. While the phenomena of the universe may not be infinite, 
even the workings of a structurally finite and indeed simple system can yet exhibit an infinite intricacy in operational or functional complexity, exhibiting this limitless complexity in its workings rather than at a spatial, structural or compositional level, he writes. For instance, while the alphabet is 26 letters, their combinations are in principle infinite. Can you think why? Feel free to post your answers in the comments. Science is our intellectual exploration of the world, an interaction of the mind with the data we obtain from nature. We can keep trying to get fuller and fuller information about nature, even if it is finite by probing deeper. However, because we can always probe deeper, scientific inquiry is potentially an endless process. At each successful state-of-the-art stage of increased precision in our investigative proceedings, the world may take on a very different gnomic appearance not because it changes, but simply because at each stage, it presents itself differently to us, writes Rasher. For instance, at a macro level where we encounter objects directly, we see a table as solid, but as we zoom into the atomic level, we realize that most of the atoms of matter are actually a void. Another model of scientific progress is accumulative convergence. As our knowledge increases, we approximate closer and closer to the truth, with new research findings supplementing and not replacing existing understanding. However, because of technological escalation that lets us probe deeper parametrically, leading us to previously unknown phenomena, we also have conceptual innovation that requires new theories which may be incommensurable with the old ones. The most significant progress is made when we have to fundamentally change our understanding of how things work, what Thomas Kuhn would term a revolution, requiring a change in the very framework itself which debunks the theory of conversions. After saying all that though, Rasher concludes his essay on what seems to me to be a false note. Ever the pragmatist, he thinks that praxis is the arbiter of theory. To him, not theoretical merit but practical capability is the best available standard for assessing scientific progress. The earlier theories of progress he examined were all concerned with the dialectic of questions and answers, but he thinks that is a wrong approach. Progress according to him lies in enhancing our capabilities through a theory's application in technology. He says, Knowledge development is a process both fueled by and manifested through our technologically mediated capabilities for interacting with nature. I think this way of measuring scientific progress may have some merit but is also not entirely correct. Earlier he spoke about how we needed technological escalation to be able to explore the parametric space more. This will be the fueled by portion of his code. However, the manifested bit is problematic. The most cutting-edge science today may or may not result in new technologies. For instance, quantum mechanics may find some applications in building faster computers, but string theory may never find any application. We still have not figured out what to do with the proof of Fermat's last theorem, and we may never be able to have any technological application from it. Besides, even when we are using the superseded theories of Newtonian mechanics, we still have many technological innovations. Ever better car engines, ever taller skyscrapers, better airplanes are just a few examples of technologies using old science that is not quite correct. They simply do not need Einstein's theory of relativity or quantum mechanics. But more importantly, when we are thinking and working out new theories, more often than not, we are not already thinking how they can be used. The theories come first for their own sake, after which perhaps someone down the road may or may not find a use for it. There is an increasing pressure on primary scientific research to pay off through commercial applications, but that is misguided. When scientists are working on theories, they may not know in advance where it would take them, whether they will be able to come up with something at all, and then whether it can result in anything useful. Some theories only find applications decades or centuries later. Some never do, and we may not know in advance which is which. Who could have thought that prime numbers would be useful in encryption technologies until it was done? We do not know what a theory can be used for until we even have the theory. Say we have a theory that was way ahead of its time, one that will not find any useful application until centuries later. Is such a theory worthless? Should it not have been discovered at all? There is an argument for science for its own sake, 
and then the argument that science that does not result in technological applications is worthless. I am on the side of the former because we have seen time and again theories that seemingly have no use become invaluable later. So like Russia, my argument is pragmatic. Besides, what really is progress? Following Russia's theory that progress is taking a theory and putting it to work in a technological application, we did that with Einstein's theory of relativity and made it into an atom bomb, wiping out two cities so far and possibly wiping out the planet in future. How about the truckloads of technological applications that feed our consumerist societies, leading to climate change? Is that what progress looks like? Russia does not touch on progress as an ethical concept in this essay, but precisely by making progress into a numbers game, be it in the theories he derided or his own, we may lose sight of what progress really means or at least should mean. Admittedly, Russia's aim in this essay is not to cover everything. The key takeaway is that what are considered the leading scientific theories of the day may be overtaken by better theories subsequently. The more we are capable of pushing the frontiers of our parametric space, the stranger things may get, as what is on a macro scale may behave rather differently and follow different laws on the smaller scales. These anomalies, peculiarities and strangeness is to be welcomed. It is what scientific discovery even looks like. We have already realized that on the quantum level and on the astronomical scale, considering things as processes rather than objects may be a better way of understanding them, such as quantum uncertainty or black holes. To understand a whole as an object is paradoxical using substance metaphysics. Using process metaphysics may be a better way. Thank you for listening to The Philosophical Bachelor.